I'm here joined today by uh, Rick Fisher, and he's here to talk to us about why hidden mineral imbalances should be on everyone's radar. Uh, I couldn't agree with that more, and I'm very excited to hear your take on this particular topic. Um, today, Rick is going to do an introduction to the real life implications of mineral imbalances on everyday health conditions. So very practically how this would apply to our work as nutritionists and talk about why these imbalances are commonly overlooked and the importance of using targeted bio-individual nutrition to best serve the health needs of our clients. For those of you who aren't familiar with him, Rick specializes in HTMA testing and protocols in clinical practice and supports detox and rebalancing of minerals to improve health and energy in his clients. He has been uh, internationally recognized as a leader in mineral-based health and nutrition education, and his research and teachings have been adopted by practitioners across the globe. So I'm really excited uh, to have him here with us tonight. Thank you, Rick, for being here. I see we have a few more folks who have filed in live. Um, so again, welcome. I know you've got a jam-packed uh, presentation for us, so I don't want to hold you off any longer. So you're welcome to take over from here, and then I'll pop back in at the end and we can do a bit of a Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you to all of you who are here joining this presentation live and also to those of you joining uh, the replay afterwards. Uh, this is very important uh, information, I believe. I see it firsthand every day in clinical practice. So it's my honor and pleasure to share it with you. So let's begin by, I guess I'll share my screen here. Okay, so the screen should be live right now, yes? It looks great. Okay, um, so this presentation is on uh, hidden mineral balances and why they should be on everyone's radar, uh, both as a practitioner as well as just for the general public as well. Um, as Veronica mentioned, my name is Rick Fisher. I am a nutritional researcher and educator. I'm the founder of coppertoxic.com, which has been bring, which has been bringing uh, copper toxicity education to the world for the past decade. Uh, number one resource for education, research, and support for copper toxicity. I'm also the founder of the Mineral Mastery Training Program on mineral-based health and nutrition. And in clinical practice, I am an HTMA practitioner as well as an instructor of HTMA. Uh, personal mentoring of practitioners, as well as through my training program. So in this presentation, we are moving away from the macro view of nutrition, away from, it's all about protein, carbs, and fats, and the percentages, and moving more into the micronutrients, specifically minerals. So I find that a lot of nutrition is based on the macro, and there's not enough education on the micro. Um, so that's what this presentation is going to be about, shining the spotlight on minerals. So ways that mineral imbalances affect health, aka common symptoms that our patients want solutions for. This can include everything from fatigue, exhaustion, gut health, injury prevention, injury healing, relationships, emotions, diabetes, heart health, mental health, sickness, hair loss, joint pain, and countless other conditions. Pretty much any condition under the sun, you name it, and there will be an underlying mineral imbalance uh, playing some role. So this is very important to be understanding the connections to mineral imbalances and being able to address them. So minerals are the spark plugs of life. Without minerals, life itself would not exist. And this is how important minerals are. And yet, 99% of the American people, and frankly, the world, are deficient in minerals, and a market deficiency in any one of the more important minerals results in disease. Now, if you look at the date of this quote, 1936, we can only imagine how much more prevalent deficiencies are today, given how depleted our soils are and how much more exposed to toxic metals and chemicals we are. Now, this quote is sometimes disputed because if we just look at a blood test, it's hard to really see these deficiencies because blood is homeostatic and doesn't always have these imbalances. But when we look at the cellular level, that's when we begin, begin to understand and see the imbalances. And I'll be discussing this in this presentation. 
So just quickly, uh, some reasons for imbalance. Uh, first, on the deficiency side of things, um, a lot of people, I know none of you watching this presentation, but some people out there, they rely on nutrient deficient junk food. Uh, alcohol, caffeine, these deplete key nutrients, stress as well. So these three things right here, alcohol, caffeine, stress, they all, and sugars as well, deplete nutrients like magnesium and zinc. Prescription drugs, a lot of prescription drugs do affect our mineral system and deplete minerals. Nutrient depleted soils, glyphosate, which is the Roundup sprayed on a lot of, a lot of commercial crops. It is a chelator of minerals. Biounavailability. This refers to the body's inability to use a nutrient. So even if we have lots of a nutrient in our body, if our body can't use it, there's still a deficiency. Poor absorption, low HCL, low hydrochloric acid. And this is a big one because most people think in terms of how much of a nutrient we are eating. You know, people look at the label of a of a supplement bottle or of a, you know the, the makeup of a certain food, and it's like, okay, well, this gives me 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams of a certain nutrient, and therefore I'm getting enough. And frankly, that is irrelevant. Okay, it is not so much what we take, it's what we assimilate. And this is a big problem because for most people, we are not assimilating our nutrients properly, regardless of how many milligrams of the nutrient we are actually eating. And low stomach acid, low hydrochloric acid plays a big role in that. And then antagonistic relationships. So this is some nutrients support each other, some nutrients have antagonistic relationships, and taking too much of one thing can cause a deficiency in something else. On the other side of the coin are toxicities, and this can come from industrial exposure, soil, home environment exposure, incorrect supplementation, taking too much of something, hormonal, I'll get into that in this presentation, and birth control, again, hormonal, uh, stress affects our minerals, Congenital compounding, and this refers to just basically what a baby inherits in utero from the mother. If a mother has a lot of toxic metals in her body, uh, part of that gets passed down uh, by the placenta in utero uh, to the fetus, and then the next generation begins life with an increased toxic load. Poor detoxification abilities, and just exposure to toxic metals as well. So let me give you an example of a mineral hormone connection because there is an overemphasis on if there's a hormone imbalance, let's just give the hormone. And there's very little understanding of how minerals basically regulate our hormones. So here is one chain. There are many chains, but here's one chain. So the estrogenic effect of oral contraceptives. So even if a birth control pill has progesterone, it's actually not progesterone, it's progestin, which is synthetic progesterone, which blocks progesterone and leads into an estrogenic effect. And the more estrogen dominant over progesterone a person is, the more they probably need uh, B6 support. B6 supports zinc utilization. Likewise, before menopause, zinc, supports the ovaries to produce progesterone. So even just stopping right there, if there is estrogen dominance, especially before menopause, there is likely an increased need for B6 and zinc. Okay, And so B6 supports zinc. Zinc deficiency impairs progesterone. I just mentioned that in terms of ovary production of progesterone. And a zinc deficiency also allows for increased copper accumulation. If there is insufficient zinc, cop intestinal copper absorption increases. And then the copper load increases. And as copper increases, it has effects on the mineral system. And those other effects can lead into more estrogen piling up. So zinc and copper are very important nutrients in terms of being able to regulate hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone as well. So why aren't mineral imbalances more widely recognized? Well, it comes down to testing. You know, most mainstream testing is based on blood and the homeostatic 
nature of blood misses the imbalances that are happening at the cell and tissue level. So this is a just a snapshot of a serum blood test. And if we look at the various markers in this serum test, we see pretty much everything falls within the reference range. So sodium 140 reference range 134 to 144, perfectly you know, in range, potassium within range, calcium within range, phosphorus within range, magnesium within range. Most doctors would not pick up any imbalance from this test. However, if we look at an HTMA, a hair tissue mineral analysis test, we can clearly see the imbalances that are happening. Now, keep in mind that serum is a very poor indicator of, of mineral status, considering that only 2% of potassium in your body is in uh, is in is in the is in the blood. Ninety eight percent is in the cell. So if you want to understand potassium, you want to be looking at cellular status, not so much blood. And same thing with magnesium. One percent of magnesium in the body is in the blood, and only zero point three percent is in the serum. And yet this is the test that most people rely on to understand their magnesium. That zero point three percent of what's in the body. So in order to recognize mineral imbalances, we need to move beyond blood testing and especially, you know, the serum level, which is highly inaccurate. So one takeaway is everybody has mineral imbalances, regardless of what a blood test shows. And you know, in, in clinical practice, I worked, you know, personally with well over 3000 clients, uh, many of which are nutritionists, dietitians, UFC fighters, gold champion athletes and the sickest of the sick as well. Every single person has imbalances. So even the nutritionists and dietitians and, and champion athletes who have supposedly all the training to make good nutritional decisions still have deficiencies. So this applies to every single, every single human really. Um, and the blood is homeostatic. It does not reflect the stored tissue levels of metals or the cellular level of minerals. Our biochemistry happens in the cell not the blood transport system. I'll, I'll just uh, take one step back here and talk about um, where it says the blood level is homeostatic, does not reflect the stored tissue level of metals. If I were to somehow take a, a bucket of liquid lead and, and dump that over you, the viewer, which I would never do, but you know, if, if I had some way of doing that and, and covered you in liquid lead, um, and then you do a blood test tomorrow, your blood test would likely show a lot of lead because your body's absorbed all of this uh, crazy amount of lead. But if you do a blood test in 30 days, your blood level of lead will likely be totally normal. It's not going to show any lead. And so any lead exposure is going to be missed. But I guarantee you, unless you have really, really good functioning detox pathways, there will be lead stored in your body tissue. The blood, the blood works quickly to get rid of the toxins. Some of that gets excreted, but a lot of it gets stored in your tissue. So imbalances are everywhere, and not just in terms of every person, every country, but also everywhere between minerals, mineral pairs. So minerals have relationships with each other. And the most common one most people are aware of is calcium magnesium. And this is why in you know, most, most stores, there will be some calcium magnesium formula where those two are sold together because they have a relationship. Same thing with copper and zinc, they have a relationship. Same thing with sodium potassium, there's a relationship between those two nutrients. So in a perfect world, we want all of these nutrients to be balanced with each other. But in the real world, everybody has different degrees of imbalances between these mineral pairs. And you guys can kind of raise your hand silently. I can't see you, but just, you know, silently raise your hand if you experience stress. Yeah, you guys are all secretly raising your hands out there because we all experience stress. And stress, even stress affects the mineral system. So the effect of stress on minerals, stress depletes magnesium. It can increase calcium in the form of calcification. 
And I will talk a bit more in this presentation about this calcium-magnesium uh, relationship and how calcification occurs. Stress also depletes zinc, which I mentioned earlier, zinc deficiency can allow for increased copper uh, to be uh, retained or accumulate. And stress depletes potassium and can increase sodium. And the sodium relationship is based on the aldosterone response. So if a under an acute stress reaction, we go back to our cave people days and the saber-toothed tiger jumps out uh, and chases us and we go into fight or flight mode, we are putting out more aldosterone and aldosterone and sodium have this very close relationship. So under stress, aldosterone is increased and that increases the body's uh, circulating level of, of uh, sodium. So hair tissue mineral analysis, HTMA, allows us to see the effects of stress among numerous other markers. On the right, just a, a sample chart from an HTMA. Um, I don't have time in this presentation to go through um, you know, all the nuances of HTMA chart interpretation. That is a science all, all to itself. Um, but we can look at some very general concepts uh, to illustrate the points I'll be making in this presentation. So uh, the, the previous slide where I had calcium magnesium imbalance, copper zinc imbalance, sodium potassium imbalance, we can kind of transpose that onto this chart and also see the effects on the mineral system where calcium goes up, magnesium down, sodium potassium and, and copper and zinc. So when I mention the HTMA allows us to see the effects of stress, well, if we have low zinc, zinc is very fundamental for supporting the immune system. Ironically, this was very much forgotten over the past several years for some bizarre reason, but zinc actually does support the immune system, believe it or not. And so with HTMA, we can literally see how stress by depleting zinc can make a person more susceptible to illness. And then also keep in mind that zinc is very important for the gut and also intestinal integrity. The zinc deficiency can open the door to leaky gut. And 80% of our immune system is in our gut. So there's also that zinc gut, gut immune system connection. And then metals, toxic metals such as mercury can displace zinc, basically impairing the role that you know, beneficial role that zinc has in the body. And also um, therefore affect the immune system and the mercury itself can create a safe hiding spot for uh, for pathogens. Talking about the immune system, everyone loves to uh, talk about vitamin D these days and how it's so important for immune health. And yes, vitamin D is absolutely important for immune health, but people are taking it the wrong way, or at least a lot of people are. Uh, it's, it's definitely important but this overemphasis of taking high dose vitamin D at 5,000, 10,000 IU, which I see being, you know, a lot of my, my patients come to me having been told by someone to take these high doses of vitamin D, it's actually making their mineral system worse and then their, their health in the long term worse. So it's magnesium that supports your vitamin D. We can actually raise vitamin D levels naturally by optimizing magnesium. And so instead of risking health by taking high dose vitamin D on a daily long-term basis, short-term for a few days during you know, sickness is fine, but taking it every day long-term as some people are doing, it's, it's not safe. And the safe approach is to support your magnesium, which then in turn supports your vitamin D. So hypomagnesia or hypomagnesemia, which is the low magnesium, impairs secretion of PTH. Reduced secretion of PTH uh, leads to low serum concentrations of 2508D3. That's your D3. Uh, magnesium deficiency impairs calcitriol production in summary. Yeah, so it's very clear that magnesium must be looked at if we want to understand vitamin D and optimize your vitamin D level. So uh, if you are interested in exploring this vitamin D connection further, uh, in terms of its effect on um, the mineral system and how to optimize it. I explain this more in my article linked down below, mineralsandhealth.com slash vitamin D danger. Uh, and I teach this much deeper also within the Mineral Mastery Training Program. 
So a couple of key takeaways, optimizing zinc and magnesium can help boost your immune system, but stress and other factors deplete both. And minerals also influence vitamins. I just gave the example there of magnesium supporting uh, vitamin D. So I'll, I'll stop here just for a second and make the point that it is not just about supplementation. Yeah, so we know that zinc and magnesium support the immune system, among many other aspects of health too. And yes, we can supplement zinc and magnesium, but we also need to understand the influences that deplete these minerals. And stress is just one. There are dozens and dozens of factors that deplete these minerals. And again, I go into this deeper in mineral mastery. Um, but if stress is not properly dealt with, then taking a supplement or, or relying on just taking a supplement is basically taking one step forward, one step back. Or I also use the analogy of trying to build a house in the middle of a tornado. You know, I mean, there's if you are living your life in a chaotic storm of stress and you hope that taking magnesium or zinc is going to fix things, it's probably not. You can take these as insurance, it's going to help you to some degree, but stress and the other factors that influence these minerals also need to be addressed. Even sugar. Sugar also depletes these, these two nutrients here, zinc and magnesium. So too does uh, too much coffee. Alcohol. Speaking of which, blood sugar control. Okay, so blood sugar control, we must be thinking about magnesium and zinc. So if we look at magnesium, guys, I know I'm going fast here. I'm going to be covering like a lot of different connections in this presentation. I want to squeeze in as much as I can in, in the hour I have. So I'm just kind of really touching on topics here and jumping from one to the next. But hopefully my point in saying all this is that it lights the spark in you to at least recognize the role that minerals do have on health. Um, so in terms of blood sugar control, magnesium plays a key role in regulating insulin. Reduced intracellular magnesium concentrations result in worsening of insulin resistance in diabetic patients. Low dietary magnesium intake is related to the development of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. So should magnesium be recognized or supported in addressing diabetes? You, you would be shocked, or maybe you aren't, because if you're working with diabetic patients, you've probably seen that doctors are not really talking about magnesium, but it's extremely important. Uh, even the NIH recognizes magnesium as the number one nutrient for addressing diabetes. But in, in most medical practice, this is, this is ignored. And same thing with zinc. People with lower zinc levels are more insulin resistant than those with higher zinc levels. Multiple studies have found high rates of zinc deficiency in patients with type 2 diabetes. So... Previously, I just mentioned how stress and too much coffee, too much alcohol, sugars deplete these nutrients. So we know that with diabetes, you want to avoid sugar, but what is the effect of the sugar on your mineral system? Understand that it's affecting your magnesium and zinc, two very key nutrients that are protective against diabetes. Injury prevention, calcium and magnesium. So our good buddies here, stress, caffeine, alcohol, medications they all lead to magnesium loss. So with magnesium loss or magnesium deficiency, there is poor deposition of calcium into bone. It is magnesium that keeps your calcium in your bones. So if you're losing all this magnesium, then calcium is not staying in bone. Instead, it leaves bone, goes into the bloodstream, circulates and gets ends up in soft tissue, leading to soft tissue calcification. So this push to give elderly people more calcium to fix or prevent osteoporosis, is that really the best approach? No, it's not. You need to be supporting your magnesium first and foremost. If the body is overloaded with too much calcium and not enough magnesium, it's kind of like a piece of chalk. You know, chalk for a blackboard, you drop that chalk, what happens? It's going to shatter into a million little pieces. That's what happens with calcium when it doesn't have enough magnesium. So very fundamental for supporting bone integrity is supporting magnesium. 
<clears throat> so when you load up your system with excess calcium, you shut down magnesium's ability to activate thyrocalcitonin, a hormone that under normal circumstances would send calcium to your bone. Magnesium, very important for bone health. Stress depletes magnesium. Support your bone, support your stress. You're indirectly keeping your bones strong. I mean, there's more to it than just that, but it's an important connection uh, to make. Injury prevention. Um, again, calcium, magnesium. You think about the qualities of those two nutrients, calcium, magnesium. Calcium, the quality of calcium is hardening, contracting. You think of, uh, you know, calcium crystals, uh, raw calcium deposits are hard. You think of magnesium. Too much magnesium, especially in you know cheaper forms, is you know well it is relaxing, but it can also relax your your bowels and cause you to spend the day on the toilet. Yeah, so magnesium has that relaxing quality. Calcium is hardening. Magnesium is relaxing and softening. So in terms of muscles, muscle firing, if you have like well relaxed muscles respond and refire uh, can respond. What am I saying? Relaxed muscles can respond and fire quickly. Tight muscles fire slower and can lead to potential injury. So when there's a magnesium deficiency, that leads to increased muscle tightness because you don't have enough magnesium to relax your muscles. And instead, there's excess calcium, which is causing increased contraction. Um, on a similar note, manganese and copper should also be considered. So manganese is extremely important for the, for the integrity of tendon strength and healing. And so too is copper. So tendons and ligaments are primarily made up of collagen. And health stores these days are filled with collagen support supplements, which is what I call the Band-Aid solution. Our, our entire approach to health nutrition is based on a Band-Aid approach. Uh, what I mean by this, sorry, I'm going off topic for a second. But what I mean by this, if a person has low iron, they're told to take iron. If a person has low vitamin D, they're told to take vitamin D. Um, you know, fix collagen, take a collagen product. These are Band-Aid approaches. They are giving a short-term solution without addressing the underlying cause. And so with, co with collagen, vitamin C is essential for collagen production. So too is vitamin A but also very commonly overlooked is copper. So copper supports the lysyl oxidase enzyme, which is necessary for the production of collagen. I'm gonna get more into copper in a moment because I'm the copper guy, um, but a lot of people have this imbalance between uh, with, with copper, both in terms of too much copper and a deficiency at the same time. So a lack of available copper can lead to issues with collagen and then in turn uh, tendons. A couple of takeaways here in summary, excess calcium without adequate magnesium can make bones weaker and can actually set oneself up for osteoporosis. Deficiencies in magnesium and zinc affect glucose control and optimizing magnesium, manganese and copper can all play roles in protecting against muscle, tendon and even bone injury. All right, let's get into copper. I've got a, um, a screenshot here in the middle, the uh, coppertoxic.com website. This is um, my early research on copper toxicity. Uh, coppertoxic.com uh, is today the, the leading uh, education research and support site for copper toxicity. Uh, there is a wealth of information on that site. Um, I go deep, very deep into copper toxicity within the Mineral Mastery course as well. I'm going to give you a very quick preview uh, here. Uh, so as sources of copper, there are, are reasons why copper accumulates. Number one, birth control. It's a big one, especially the copper IUD. Copper IUD is a fairly obvious one because, well, it's, it's copper uh, going into the body. Um, but even hormonal contraceptives can lead to copper accumulation. Um, increased estrogen can increase copper retention and vice versa, increased copper retention can lead to uh, increased estrogen. Um, and so estrogens in the environment as well 
we're talking xenoestrogens, phytoestrogens can also uh, lead to copper accumulating uh, plant-based diet. And this is primarily due to the phytates in the plant-based diet, which dramatically impairs zinc absorption. So I mentioned earlier how a deficiency of magnesium can lead to copper accumulating in the body. And I also mentioned how it's not how much you eat or what you eat, it's what you assimilate. And so even if uh, the plant-based eater is eating lots of zinc, which, you know, if you're eating a healthy plant-based diet, you, you likely are, the phytates have a massive impairing effect on your, on your zinc absorption. Uh, so a lot of vegetarians, vegans do have a zinc deficiency, which then allows for copper to accumulate. Sulfates, especially copper sulfates sprayed on, on produce, even organic produce sprayed with copper sulfates, a known toxin to mankind. Um, another fact is copper gets stored in the body, whereas zinc gets used up every day. So just that very nature of copper being stored and zinc getting used up quickly adds to why copper uh, may accumulate. Drinking water, if people are drinking um, water through copper piping, and if that copper piping in their home is leaching copper off of the pipes into the water, you know, that can be a source of uh, increased copper exposure. In utero, again, getting passed down from mother to, uh, to fetus. And stress can also lead to increased copper accumulation. So as copper accumulates, it has certain effects on the mineral system and on health. This is a very simplistic, overly simplistic diagram. Uh, there's a lot more involved to this, uh, but just you know, some, some basic concepts here. Copper accumulates, it has a negative uh, impact on magnesium, potassium, and zinc, uh, and it can increase calcification. Um, stress, copper have a, have, a, um, have a relationship. And then copper is an excitotoxin, so it is stimulating initially. So it can stimulate the adrenal glands, it can stimulate the brain, uh, making us take on more and more projects. But over time, that chronic overstimulation can lead to a weakening of the adrenals or a uh, you know, insufficient uh, production of adrenal hormone. Uh, as calcium rises and potassium drops, that leads to the sometimes the slowing of the thyroid or, th or hypothyroid more commonly would be simply thyroid hypoexpression, where on a, on a blood lab clinically, the thyroid markers are still normal, but the patient has the symptoms of hypothyroid. And we can see that this graph here is a good example of it uh, with a high calcium and a low potassium leading into that hypothyroid expression pattern. Um, at extremely high levels of calcification, this can lead into the calcium shell. I explain calcium shell more on coppertoxic.com. It is more of an emotional effect, uh, numbing down the emotions. Um, Ceruloplasmin. Ceruloplasmin is a very important protein that binds to copper to support the availability of copper, and then in turn, supporting the availability of iron. But as a person moves more and more into burnout, then the liver, <laughs> the liver, is less able to produce adequate ceruloplasmin. And so low ceruloplasmin leads to biounavailability of copper. I, I'm very aware that I'm speaking very fast right now and kind of flying through things. Uh, so again, I, there's a lot that I want to give you in this presentation. Um, if you do want to study this slower <laughs> and, and deeper, um, I go through all this on, uh, on coppertoxic.com as well as mineral mastery as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll skip over some of this. Uh, I'll begin on the left-hand side here. So that high calcium magnesium ratio, again, that's gonna affect, uh, in, uh, affect uh, blood sugar. Um, as blood sugar drops, uh, adrenaline uh, is, is uh, secreted more and adrenaline is an anxiety and panic hormone. So a patient may have higher, um, you know, exhibit higher degrees of anxiety and panic reactions. Um, weight gain, maybe the thyroid is slowing. Uh, the emotional effects of excess copper building up are very, very profound um, to, to, to the most extreme case of even suicide. Uh, this, this is serious stuff. And 
I think yesterday was mental health day and I hear it every single, every single year, mental health. Nobody is talking about any of these mineral connections, especially copper. Um, and then ceruloplasmin declines. And so people have iron anemia. And unless there is very, very heavy blood loss happening, or perhaps, you know, with, with vegans uh, who, who may need some more iron, in most cases, the low iron is based on uh, an issue with a deficiency of available copper to which low ceruloplasmin is, is a factor. Um, so copper toxicity imbalance is a contributing factor behind many energy and mental health issues. However, it is never just about copper. And I've got, you know, I, I see a lot of people online who have a copper IUD and they think, well, I'll just remove the copper IUD and detox my copper. But that's ignoring all of the effects that copper has had on the rest of the mineral system. So copper needs to be looked at in the context of the entire mineral system. So if we use the analogy of, of uh, dominoes here, you know, copper can be the catalyst that knocks over other minerals or causes imbalance in other minerals. And if you just pick up the copper piece, that's great, but you haven't picked up all the other minerals that have been left unbalanced. So again, this is why it's not just about addressing copper. We need to look at, at the body holistically, the minerals, you know, minerals holistically. For example, copper influences calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, and others. And each of those other imbalances has their own sets of symptoms. And so addressing copper must also consider these other imbalances. Um, quickly, energy. So energy, we think of often it is an adrenal issue, sometimes thyroid. Yes, these are very important um, aspects for energy, but there's a lot more behind fatigue or chronic fatigue than just the adrenals or just the thyroid. Um, so our mitochondria do play a role with energy production. They are the energy factories of our cells. And your body is only as healthy as your mitochondria. Again, mitochondria produce ATP energy, which gives the body energy. But it's magnesium that combines with ATP to produce energy in the mitochondria. So magnesium is your fuel for ATP energy. And as I've alluded to already, things like stress, low potassium, glyphosate on, uh, on, on crops, coffee, alcohol, these factors all deplete magnesium. So one aspect, if you're dealing with fatigue or your patients are dealing with fatigue, one aspect, there are many, but one is to not only support magnesium uh, through diet and supplementation, but also look at these factors which are depleting magnesium and thereby impairing uh, mitochondrial energy production. So the wheel of human energy is uh, a model of human energy that I've developed. I teach this within the Mineral Mastery course. It basically looks at all the factors that come together to support human energy. Um, and as you can see, I mean, you probably can't read uh, this chart and that's okay, um, but you can see just uh, graphically, there are many, many, many connections um, to energy. And it's more than just adrenals, more than just thyroid, and even more than just um, magnesium as well. There's a lot to consider. So this is one of the things I also teach much deeper within Mineral Mastery. There's a whole unit on just energy. Um, also, mitochondria and melatonin. So melatonin product, uh, protects the mitochondria from damage. It also reduces oxidative stress and increases glutathione. So low zinc impairs melatonin. And do you guys remember what impairs zinc? Well, we've got, again, stress, alcohol, caffeine, sugars. We've got low absorption of zinc, low stomach acid. All of these factors can impair zinc. Toxic metals as well, like mercury, can uh, really impair zinc. So all these factors can impair zinc, which then can influence melatonin and affect sleep as well as energy production uh, in the cell. Melatonin also, of course, um, affects circadian rhythm, and circadian rhythm um, affects our, um, our mitochondria and melatonin. Brain fog. I'm jumping all over the place here, but you know, again, I'm, I'm giving you some, some tidbits here of connections to certain symptoms and why it's important to address 
the mineral uh, system. Um, Veronica, can you give me a rough idea of what we are, where we are for time? I have no idea. <laughs> it is just after 6.40, so about 43 minutes in. Okay, perfect. So brain fog, uh, lots of reasons behind uh, brain fog. One can be candida and associated mycotoxins. So in terms of candida, well, copper does have a role to play with candida. Copper is our natural antifungal when it is bioavailable in the body. But if copper is not available, or also deficiency of zinc too, can create an, can create an environment where candida can more easily flourish. So yes, you can address candida directly, uh, caprylic acid and different uh, techniques to address candida directly, but often if the copper and zinc imbalance is not addressed, that candida can just come back and often does come back. Liver disease, liver congestion uh, can influence uh, brain clarity, copper and metals can affect the liver, uh, liver congestion. Uh, brain fog is also very common with leaky gut and our good friend zinc. Uh, deficiency of zinc can open the door to uh, leaky gut by making the intestinal lining more permeable. And metals, metal toxicities, aluminum, mercury, these all affect um, our liver, brain clarity, and our mineral system as well. Emotions relationships. So I mentioned very quickly the calcium shell. This is a buildup of excess calcium, uh, not only around the cell, um, it's, it's calcification basically, calcification of tissue, calcification around the cell, also calcification of the pineal gland. So the calcium shell has a very profound effect on emotions and in turn relationships. Um, my, my early mentor and uh, the godfather of a lot of this research, Dr. Uh, Dr. Malter, he's now in his mid eighties, um, but he's been doing this psych psychology work for nearly five decades now. Um, he and I, by the way, are, um, we, we, we are running, we present at the uh, HTMA virtual summit every November. Um, uh, on a side note, if you watching this are interested in HTMA more. I am the co-founder of the HTMA Virtual Summit, htmavirtualsummit.com. That's happening mid-November. Um, several of us get together, uh, pioneers, experts get together and talk about uh, HTMA and mineral related uh, topics, uh, free education in that summit. Dr. Malter will be speaking there as well. So the calcium shell, as excess copper and calcium increase in the cells and tissues, a calcium shell will build that will tend to block more and more feelings until a person no longer is aware of what's being felt and experienced. Such a person often talks of not feeling anything or being numb uh, and dead emotionally. Uh, and I've seen this um, more times than I would like to, uh, even in uh, personal life uh, relationships, um, this calcium shell effect. It is very real and it's, uh, you know, frankly, very disappointing that relationship counselors have have no training uh, in, in this connection. And again, mineral mastery, the point of mineral mastery, part of it is to build the bridge between these mineral imbalances and psychology. Uh, also, uh, increased stress response. So I mentioned earlier how HTMA can be used to measure stress. Well, a high sodium to potassium ratio as seen in an HTMA, increases our negative stress response. It increases the fight or flight reaction. Remember I mentioned the saber-toothed tiger jumping out, aldosterone increases, sodium goes up. That's the fight or flight, high sodium, low potassium, increased fight or flight, along with increased tendency for anger, panic, anxiety, emotional aggressiveness, and a shortening of one's fuse in stressful situations. And also, um, nutrients that can, that can ameliorate PMS symptoms are also affected by this high copper. So magnesium, zinc, and vitamin B6, uh, these are nutrients that can help bring down some of the PMS symptoms, but these are commonly low with excess copper. So another key takeaway with low zinc, increasing the risk of depression and impairing serotonin. Excess calcium leading to the emotionally, emotionally numb calcium shell. 
and excess copper affecting neurotransmitters, energy, and other minerals, these imbalances can have profound implications on relationships. So minerals hold a vital key to better understanding and addressing both physical and mental health. So uh, the next couple of minutes, just uh, very quickly here, I'm going to just talk about Mineral Mastery, which is the course that does build the bridge between nutrition and physical and mental health. So Mineral Mastery course uh, teaches the influences of mineral imbalances, why we have the various imbalances we have and the connections, the interrelationships of minerals. Um, I go into magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, zinc, iron, phosphorus, manganese, iodine, selenium, and more. Um, the mineral rela relationships with vitamins and toxic metals. So in this presentation, I mentioned very briefly the connection between magnesium and vitamin D. That's one example. But again, your minerals help regulate your, your uh, vitamins. And same thing, minerals and toxic metals have relationships. So if you know if you know what toxic metals are in your body, that also helps guide the, a, a detox protocol by addressing the specific minerals that have relationships with those toxic metals. Uh, it gives powerful clarity on copper toxicity. This is the leading course on copper toxicity education, the direct connections to physical and mental health, specific detox protocols and detox considerations, an introduction to HTMA, testing in general, as well as HTMA chart analysis, and a special section on human energy. Uh, the course is 10 eye-opening modules, 30 plus videos, uh, 15 plus hours of video content, your pace, completely your schedule, course handbooks with the slides, lifetime access with updates. Over the years, I have added many updates to the course and even my early students from uh, many years ago are able to go back and, and take advantage of the new content that is added. And same thing if you know if you join today and content is added you know five years from now, you will still be able to have access to all that new content as well. Um, there is a full 30 day uh, full satisfaction guarantee. So for any reason it, it does not not just satisfy you, if it does not blow your freaking mind open, um, full money back guarantee. There is absolutely no risk whatsoever and it is an affordable course because I want every, I wish every human would take this course. It's uh, it's very powerful. So this is next level training for all health and nutrition uh, professionals. Uh, many courses charge thousands of dollars and yet students are graduating without having learned even a fraction of what Mineral Mastery teaches. Uh, the tuition is 597. Um, of course, I'm honored to be here um, on this webinar um, with all of you nutritionists. Uh, so I'm happy to offer a discount to you um, right now for this very special inner circle, um, save 40% um, with the promo code, and this is original, I know, networking. Promo code is valid for uh, the next two weeks. So from now till October 25th, um, if you use the promo code networking at mineralmastery.com, you will save 40% on, on tuition. Uh, two little points here. First, after October 25th, that promo code is still valid. So if you happen to be watching this presentation on a replay and you don't get to this uh, until November or whenever, you can still use that promo code networking, um, but the discount will be 20% instead of 40% after October 25th. And also there is another bonus to joining now because uh, as of January, of course, tuition will be increasing uh, to 697 as more and more content has been added. It's time to uh, start raising the tuition. So now is there is no better time now if you are interested in learning about mineral based health nutrition. This is the uh, the best chance right now. Um, these these quotes or testimonials um, all from my students, these are all from uh, fellow nutritionists, health practitioners, the most beneficial course I've ever taken. Everyone should have this information. This is the missing link in all the training I've done. Um, exceptional. I wish the whole world could experience this course. I was not taught this, not even at the master's level. I've taken many courses. This one was by far the most informative. This course is a must. Um, so 
it's it's kind of odd for me to you know sit here and promote my own course so the the most powerful is to just head to mineral mastery on your own time and read the stories of other students who've been through the course um, far more than anything i could say as to the power of the course um, i'll hope i hope you join me with mineral mastery uh, it will certainly uh, blow your mind wide open and take your practice to the next level again 40 percent code with networking and i thank you sincerely for um, being part of this presentation so veronica back to you um any questions or how do you want to go from here yeah thank you so much rick that was a lot of information packed into a little bit of time <laughs> i know and I, i'm sorry i spoke fast there i was trying to squeeze everything in no, well done. We did have a couple questions come in already. And as I mentioned before we started, there were a few um, sent in in advance as well. But for those of you who are here live, if you have a question that you would like to ask Rick, please pop that into the Q&A box now and we will get there. So the first one that I saw sent in, Rick, was uh, if you have a favorite magnesium product to recommend. Favorite magnesium will depend on the symptom because there are many forms of magnesium. And in terms of absorption, if you want a high absorption magnesium, you want to be looking at a glycinate, bisglycinate, or malate, or chloride. These are good absorption forms of magnesium. Um, but uh, let's say a person is, you know, let's say their, their primary symptom is constipation. Well, then you could use one of the cheaper forms like oxide. I would never recommend magnesium oxide as, to support your magnesium level. It's garbage. It's cheap. It's garbage. However, it does have that laxative quality. So again, if that's a symptom, then you could use the oxide form to support that symptom. Likewise, if a person has uh, oxalate issues, yeah, high oxalates call for the citrate form of magnesium. So again, there is one of my overriding themes is there is no one size fits all protocol. Every person needs to be looked at on an individual basis, listen to the symptoms, and then base recommendations off their health history and symptoms. Um, so for some people, a citrate form is, is best, especially with oxalate issues, or otherwise glycinate, malate, chloride are great. A uh, question that was sent in in advance here. When should you test or retest using HTMA or how often should you do this testing? Any time is fine for testing. Uh, you don't need to wait for, um, um, let's say for oh, a few examples. Let's say a person, I'll give you a few examples. Let's say a person has a copper IUD and sometimes the question is, well, should I wait until I remove the copper IUD, IUD to get tested? Um, or another example is uh, I'm pregnant right now. Should I wait until after pregnancy, after delivery uh, to get tested? It doesn't matter. You can test anytime. Okay. As long as the practitioner you're working with is looking at your health history and like, what's going on for you. So HTMA should never be read at face value. And it's very important to the practitioner to be looking at what are the influences in your life right now? Are you pregnant? Because pregnancy does influence um, supplementation. Uh, is there a copper IUD in your body or was it taken out recently or, or all that? So you can test anytime. Um, if let's say a person has bleached hair, well, then you might have to wait because coloring the hair sample uh, can make the sampling more difficult. Uh, ideally, you want untreated virgin hair, not uh, definitely not bleached. Um, if it's dyed, uh, we can still work with it as long as we know what color dye it is. Um, but you know, if you just bleached your hair, you got to wait you know a month or so until at least a little bit of hair grows out um, to test. And then for retesting, ideally, the ideal is four or five months. Okay, but. Uh, I'll say, you know, amongst my amongst my patients, I don't push that. It's it's very flexible, and everybody has their own budgets. Um, and I say, I, I tell my patients, any time between four months and a year is fine. You know, um, I've got a couple of uh, like athlete clients who are very 
focused on micromanaging their minerals and you know, they're testing every two or three months. I, I think that's too much. You, you don't need to because things don't move that quickly. So the sweet spot is four, five, six months. Excellent. Um, we are a group of nutritionists here. So one of the questions that was asked is what role do diet and nutrition play in maintaining a healthy balance of minerals in the body? Are you able to speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so what role do diet and nu uh, nutrition have in maintaining a healthy balance of minerals in the body? Mm -hmm. It plays some role, but here's the thing. Um, again, it's not how much you take, it's what you assimilate. And I know if I look at my nutritionist clients and dietitian clients who are, for the most part, eating very healthy, they still have imbalances, even if they're eating the healthiest of diets, because stress affects your minerals. Toxic metal exposures affect your minerals. What you inherited in utero affect your minerals. The absorption of nutrients affects your, your minerals. So diet definitely plays a role. I'm not saying live off junk food. I'm saying eat healthy. But what I'm also saying is it's not just about what we consider a healthy diet. There's a lot more involved uh, that influence our body's mineral system. So eat healthy, get tested, know what your unique imbalances are, and then adjust those specific imbalances just to optimize things. All right, Munir, uh, Munira sent in a question here as well. She said, can you share more about how much detail the course goes into for the mineral mental health connection and what kind of protocol is included? Mm -hmm. um, I do not believe there is a course out there in existence that goes deeper into the mental health connection with minerals, um, especially in unit five, which is the copper uh, copper and zinc unit, uh, very close connections to mental health. So I do go deep into this topic. Um, probably, I don't I mean, in terms of time, there's probably close to an hour dedicated to just the mental health connections um, that minerals influence. Uh, so it becomes very clear through the course uh, exactly how minerals do influence mental health in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety. These are, you know, the two biggest uh, influences that minerals have, uh, pseudo bipolar or bipolar symptoms. Um, and then even as I mentioned, suicide, uh, which, you know, uh, it's definitely a dark topic, but I, I do explain uh, that connection as well. So it's definitely an important connection that not only practitioners make, but also hopefully the general public uh, can can learn to protect themselves or, or their daughters. Um, and sorry, Veronica, what was the second part of the question? Uh, what kind of protocol is included? The protocol, it's the course is not about giving a protocol because the protocol depends on every single person as a unique individual. So I lay the foundation so that people can understand, um, you know, if a patient is presenting with the, this set of symptoms, here are the things to look at, okay? But a protocol should be designed based on the patient's health history. Um, maybe even genetics, other factors uh, play into protocol guidance as well. So the protocol itself should be based on what the practitioner um, you know, figures out with their client, but I'm providing you the connections between the imbalances and minerals, uh, I'm sorry, between the imbalances and the symptoms. And then also with HTMA, if you are working with HTMA, I find too often uh, people will just get a lab account and open up a you know account for HTMA testing and they'll get a chart back with some high levels and some low levels and then start uh, giving a protocol based on well this is low take this this is high take this and that is not how HTMA works so I explain why this high level is actually a low level and why this low level could be a high level and and, and then why the reasons behind this is so important the reasons behind these levels. 
And when you understand the reasons behind these levels, now you can give protocol guidance because you understand the causes, the factors that are influencing the minerals. Uh, next like when question. I work in practice, sorry, Veronica, when yeah. I work in practice, when I work in practice, I do not give anybody a, a, a single one size fits all protocol. Every protocol I design is individual. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I, I can't, there's no way that in my integrity, I could give like a one size fits all protocol. Uh, I want to teach you the foundation so that you can then go forward and make your own protocols. So the next question here was, if you have a particular line or brand of mineral products that you like to recommend over another, and similarly, if you have a lab that you prefer for doing the testing. My clients are worldwide, and not every country or location has access to all products. I also stay away from being married to one product line. Uh, or a product line for which I'm going to get lots of commission uh, money from, because then I feel I'm biased. Uh, you know, if, if I'm just promoting one product line and I'm getting commission off it, um, it doesn't sit well with some people. So I try to remain unbiased and um, I, I work with many different um, brands, product lines, and it depends on the actual supplement itself, who I will uh, suggest to work with. In terms of HTMA testing, I prefer trace elements. Uh, I would suggest if you are uh, considering adding HTMA into your practice, work with either trace elements, TEI, trace elements, Inc., or analytical research labs, ARL. These are both the pioneering labs that uh, develop this entire science of nutritional balancing, mineral balancing, um, and and connecting the dots between HTMA and, and minerals and health symptoms. They are the pioneers. They follow all protocol properly. Um, which one you work with doesn't really matter. They're both, uh, in, in my view, almost equally good. Personally, I prefer trace elements just because they do test for more, um, for more elements. So I am able to get more information out of a trace elements lab chart. All right, I have two more questions for you. Uh, the first of which Stephanie sent in, she says, with the push from natural health practitioners to take zinc during COVID times and no mention of copper to balance it, did you find mineral imbalance from high doses of zinc taken in any of your patients? Uh, she was hearing suggestions of taking 50 to 100 milligrams daily of zinc. Yeah, so you, you can certainly take too much zinc and cause a copper deficiency. That's absolutely legit. Um, however, most people do have some degree of excess copper. Um, and I've, it's a, it's a good question. I've not seen a true deficiency of copper uh, develop. Well, I shouldn't say that either. Um, I can say that most of my clients that I work with, uh, I don't have them taking such high doses of zinc to begin with. Um, I'm typically dosing around uh, anywhere between 10 to 30 milligrams. Um, and you know, maybe in an acute uh, illness situation, then you're taking 50 or 100, but short term. And I always uh, remind people that if you are taking all of this zinc, you do need to balance your copper as well or support copper through, through diet. Um, Mo yeah, honestly, if I think back to my clients, I very few of them uh, were taking high dose um, zinc. Um, and in some cases, it's actually beneficial because it can, well, nah, again, very individual. If a person has excess copper, you can use high dose zinc, but it can also backfire. And I have seen uh, high dose zinc absolutely backfire by causing an increased mobilization of copper or mercury or some other toxin as well. So um, the, the copper deficiency for a lot of people, it stems from copper toxicity to begin with, in which case some zinc is beneficial, but I do not support high dose zinc supplementation uh, across the board. Tolerance is very individual. Some people can do okay with it, but most people need to stick with lower doses of zinc. 
All right. And my last question for you here uh, has to do with your course. So they're wondering, is there any continued support once the certification has been completed? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so a lot of my students who are practitioners end up going on to create HTMA accounts. Uh, they open up a lab account. Uh, I am available for mentorship uh, on an as needed basis uh, for practitioners. So I have mentored many, many practitioners as they get started with HTMA. Um, there is there is no course that can adequately teach all the nuances of HTMA. Uh, HTMA is just a, just a heads up. It is infinitely complex. Even when I began, I thought it was easy. And, uh, you know, my first my first 50 to 70 HTMA tests, you know, I, I was a baby. I was still learning, to be honest. Um, it, you need to do hundreds of these to really get the hang of it. And so while there are some very basic patterns that um, are easy to teach uh, in the real world, there are infinite patterns that will show up. And this is where uh, very often, uh, you know, a new HTMA practitioner will be confused. It's like, well, what does this mean? What's what's causing this pattern? And I'm available um, for consultation uh, for practitioners uh, whenever they need for mentorship. So yes, that's always available. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. Again, you shared a lot of information in a little bit of time. And we also appreciate that very deep discount that you're offering to our members. That's a really valuable offer. So we appreciate that. Um, I know you have the summit going on in November. We will share the information about that along with this replay as well. Um, and all the ways that folks can get in touch with you and your team as well, if they're interested in taking your course. So thank you one last time for being here. I really appreciate it. This was a, a great hour and a bit. Awesome. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you uh, to everybody watching this presentation. Um, all my or my websites are shown shown below there. And uh, yeah, you can always reach out to Veronica uh, to get in touch with me as well. I'm here in support always. This is my passion and anything I can do to increase uh, education awareness of mineral imbalances and health or HTMA. And that's my jam. So thanks, guys, for watching. <laughs>